Hebrews 10, and uh, let's begin there with verse 32. We read down and looked at verse, down through verse 31. Last time, verse 31, is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, it's not a fearful thing if you're saved. It's not, in fact, that's the, the best place for you to be, in the hands of God. And uh, God will protect you, God will bear you up, God will save you. And uh, there's not a thing you can do to lose your salvation. Uh, if you're in the hands of God, God's taking care of it, there's nothing to worry about. However, if you die without him, then you have plenty to worry about. Let's begin there at verse 32 and read down through verse 39. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great uh, fight of affliction. Partly, whilst ye were made a uh, gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have, um, excuse me, that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not, excuse me, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promises, excuse me, the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But he, excuse me, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Despite the fact that verse 39 says the just shall live by faith, just as Paul said back in Romans 1, verse 17. In fact, that verse, the just shall live by faith, Romans 1, 17, was the verse that provoked the thinking and brought conviction to Martin Luther, who was a Dominican monk up to that time, that he didn't have to work and earn his salvation, that the just shall live by faith. He could trust in God alone to do it. But despite the fact that the verse says that. Here, it says a man can draw back, and that he can draw back unto perdition, verse 39. Which um, it doesn't say in the book of, he of Romans, as opposed to the saving of the soul, mentioned here in verse 39. It's a system requiring faithful uh, obedience, faithfulness to good works in the future, in the tribulation. I want you to Look at a couple of verses. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians 1, verses 7 and 8. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also uh, confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, notice verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is God that does the saving. Therefore, it has to be God who does the keeping, God who does the protecting, God who causes you to grow, God who brings the scripture to your remembrance, God who gives you comfort, God gives, who gives you assurance of your salvation from the day you trust Jesus, trust Jesus Christ until he comes again and calls you home. If Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 39 were Pauline verses. They sure don't match anything taught in the books of Romans and Galatians and elsewhere in Paul's epistles. However, notice how well the verses do match some Old Testament texts. Go forward a couple pages to the book of James. James chapter 2. James 
2. Notice there verses 15 through 17. James 2, 15 through 17. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Look at chapter 1, James 1, and verse 11. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the, um, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Job chapter 27. I'm sorry, stay there in James chapter uh, 5. James chapter 5. Before we go to Job, James chapter 5, and verses 5 and 6. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and, have, uh, and he does not resist you. Go um, back to the book of Job. Job chapter 27, Job 27. And let's read verses 19 through 22. Job 27, verses 19 through 22. The rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered. Uh, he openeth his mouth, and he is not. Terrors take hold on him as waters. A tempest stealeth him away and the night in the night. The east wind casteth him away, and he departeth. And, is, uh, and as a storm um, hurleth him out of his place. For God shall cast upon him uh, and not spare him, excuse me, and not spare, he would fain flee out of his hand. Go to Job chapter 20, back to Job chapter 20. Job 20 and verses, uh, let's see, verse, I want to say verses 15 and 16. He shall swallow down riches, and he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. He shall suck the poison of asps. The viper's tongue shall uh, slay him. And also verse 19 there. Because he hath oppressed and hath forsaken the poor, because he hath, because, excuse me, uh, I don't know why I'm having such difficulty. Because he hath violently taken away an house which he builded not. Job 22. Job 22. Verses six and seven. But thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, and stripped the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, um, and thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. Verse nine. Thou hast sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless uh, have been broken. Go forward to the book of Psalms, Psalm 49. Psalm 49, verses 16 and 17. Psalm 49, verses 16 and 17. 
Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. That's sort of a universal truth. Everybody knows that much. You can't take it with you. And there's a thousand jokes about that. You've never seen a, a funeral hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You're not going to take it with you. And if, you, and if they do bury it in the ground with you, you still won't be able to avail yourselves, yourself of it. <clears throat> then go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 and 36. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, uh, Come, ye blessed of my father, excuse me, uh, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Still living in Old Testament times. This is what a lot of Christians fail to remember, is that before the coming, uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, even during his earthly ministry, the world was still bound by the laws of Moses and living in quote-unquote Old Testament times. After the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the gospel of grace has begun to be preached, then uh, those requirements of commandments and ordinances laid out by Moses were no longer binding on the one who had turned to God by faith. But um, not everyone in, in, understands that. Nobody rightly divides the word of truth. They seem to think all of the Bible is the same, that uh, there's really no distinction between one verse and another, one time period and another. There's nothing much to be learned by trying to separate them or divide them correctly, that you're spinning your wheels. But to hoard up wealth or riches in the tribulation will damn you. Look back at James chapter 5. James chapter 5, once again. James 5, and look at verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, uh, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Yo, so, they say, if you want to be rich, you have to give it away, and you'll have you know, spiritual riches. But nobody wants spiritual riches. They want actual riches. They want silver. They want gold. They want possessions. They want stocks. They want savings. They want large checking accounts with large um, balances in them. They want their wealth now. They want their possessions now. They want all the good things that life can give them now. And to live that way as though those things were permanent, as, as if those things were going to have a lasting uh, part to play, in eternity is to be a fool. And God's going to hold men responsible for hoarding up wealth and not giving out to the poor. Being charitable enough to give to the poor is going to be a major requirement of people uh, after the rapture in the time of great tribulation. This is what people don't want to consider. They don't want to think of it that way. But um, observe the language of our Bible. Look at verse 37 back in our text. Might help if I go back there too. Hebrews 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Compare that with John chapter 16. Go back to John chapter 16. If you come across verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or in the book of Revelation, 
or the general epistles as we've talked about before, and they don't match something that's clearly spelled out and clearly described in any of the Apostle Paul's letters, then there's a safe bet that what you're reading isn't binding on a believer in the New Testament church now, but it will be uh, binding and someone will be obligated to fulfill it in the future after the rapture in the tribulation. And uh, bear in mind that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those books cover the time, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ before his death, burial, and resurrection. And so they were still in Old Testament times then, as they will be much again um, after the catching away of the saints. But John chapter 16, let's start there at verse 12. John chapter 16, and beginning there at verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all, excuse me, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. By the way, this is just a side comment. When someone says they're full of the Holy Ghost, we believe in the filling of the Holy Ghost, and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, and blessed Holy Ghost, and blessed Holy Spirit, that person's not full of the Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit of God uh, means that your emphasis is then on magnifying Jesus Christ. The work of the Holy Ghost is to magnify Jesus Christ not to magnify himself. And you can always tell these people who aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, they're always talking about the Holy Spirit. They, they talk very little about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They think somehow being filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, full of the Spirit, and is the key, the key element in Christian life. Uh, it is not. To be filled with the Holy Ghost means your emphasis will then be on the work and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. His ministry, his miracles, his saving grace, his coming again. Verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while and ye shall see me. Again a little while and ye shall... Uh, excuse me. No, I, I misread that. A little while and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall see me. And again a little while, he shall not see me, uh, because I go to the Father. They said therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that? I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. <clears throat> A little while, and the world seeth me, but then a little while, and it won't see me. And that phrase, besides Hebrews 10, that phrase, a little while, is found seven times in this passage here in John chapter 16. It goes well beyond, um, they see him now, but the, he's going to die and go to, the, go to Calvary, and they won't see him after he ascends to him. It goes well beyond that. Look at the next verse, verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the, ang the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. That verse actually was true. Um, when my son was born, my wife said, you know, I don't even remember the pain of the labor and delivery. Somehow she couldn't recall it. I mean, she was in a lot of pain, like most women are going through labor and childbirth. But after that son was born, somehow that thought disappeared from her mind. All she could think about was that 
She had a baby. She had a son now. So the Lord certainly knew what he was talking about when he uttered those words. But uh, <clears throat> Daniel's 70th week is going to be a time of great sorrow for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people. While the rest of the world rejoices, the Jews were nothing but trouble for all of their history. We'd be better off without them. Uh, and yet joy, there'll be joy and deliverance at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And let's look at the first six verses there. Hebrews 11, and let's read the first six verses there. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained uh, witness that he was righteous, uh, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 1 uh, tells us that faith is both substance and evidence. It's tangible. There's something to it. Um, it might not be seen every time, for example, look forward at uh, verse 7 here in chapter 11. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, being born of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, and prepared an ark to the saving of his house, or, excuse me, to saving of his house, uh, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of, right, of the righteousness, which is by faith. And also verse 27 down there. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, speaking of Moses in his case. But faith is said to have uh, be uh, substance and evidence. Now the ultimate object of your faith might manifest itself in some other medium, but you have both substance and evidence in your hands. If you're holding a copy of the Holy Bible, you have substance and evidence that there is a God. When we were watching the, the Catholic debate between Dr. Ruckman and Carl Keating, this was back in 1985, I think it was 1985, and it was held down at the First Baptist Church in Long Beach. And the video didn't do it justice, first of all, the video quality was extremely poor in 1985. Some guy with a very, very bad, um, you know, recorders. Uh, in those days, it was all VHS, right? And uh, so the, the video was very poor. Uh, the content is excellent, but the camera didn't do it justice and have a fixed uh, image for about three, four hours there, didn't do it justice. There were at least 300 people in that downstairs meeting hall at the First Baptist Church. They had a, a downstairs chapel, which sat about 400 to 500 people. And uh, the up upstairs auditorium, the main auditorium, could seat 12 to 1,500 easily. And so the, the video didn't do it justice, and that was disappointing. But I was lucky enough to be at that debate 
And um, every time I watch that grainy video, I'm trying to see myself, the back of my head, uh, because I have an idea roughly where we were sitting. Although the, the uh, video is so clear, the Christmas isn't clear enough, I can't tell which is me, who, who's me, you know, who I am. But anyway, in that video, uh, and in that debate, um, Carl Keating was speaking about how do we know the Bible is inspired? Well, we can't say it's inspired because it gives us good feelings. That's subjective. We can't say it's inspired, it's inspired by God because we like the sound of certain words that it contains. We can't say it's inspired because of any number of other reasons. He says only because we have an authoritative church that uh, is wise enough to read and disseminate it for us and tell us which parts of the Bible are inspired, which ones aren't, which books belong in the canon of Scripture, which ones don't. And, of course, his, everything was based upon the Catholic Church's word. We know it's inspired, we believe it's inspired, because the Church tells us so, effectively, what he was saying. And then when he sat down, Doc Ruckman came up to uh, rebut that. He said, we don't take anyone's word for it at all. We believe the Bible's inspired because of mathematic and statistical probabilities. He talked about um, breaking down the prophecies of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are 48 distinct prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ. He would be born of the tribe of Judah. That's where you have to eliminate all the other 11 tribes of Israel. He would born, be born in Bethlehem while, uh, of Judea. Well, you have to eliminate all the other towns in Judea. And he says, all of the specifics about the coming in, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ were fulfilled exactly as the prophets said they would be. And this, the odds of that happening, of all of the details falling into place as they uh, did, came to one out of ten chances to the 157th power. There's one chance out of 10 with 157 zeros after it would be the odds of all of those prophecies coming to pass just as they were said to come to pass in the, by the Old Testament prophets. So we don't take any church's word for it at all. And you know, there was a guy named Stoner. I forget his first name. He was a retired math professor at L.A. City College. And he's the one that figured out these odds many years ago, a math professor. And so that... Um, I'm not taking Dr. Ruckman's word for it. He was simply repeating what a math professor had calculated. That one chance out of 10 to 100, with 157 zeros following it, would be necessary for all the prophecies of Christ's first coming to fall into place as they did, when they did, how they did, where they did, uh, in the time of world history that they did, uh, without any mistakes whatsoever, without any errors. And he says, if that happens with those odds, is then why shouldn't we believe the, the other 400 prophecies of his second coming that the Bible lays out for us? And uh, I thought it was very effective. It was very persuasive. And uh, most of us don't think in those terms. But nevertheless, that's how God does it, so that's beyond dispute. We have uh, substance and evidence that the Word of God, that the Bible rather, is the Word of God, and we can have faith in it because of uh, examples such as those. And it's been said the ABCs of faith are defined like this. It's an action based on a belief sustained by confidence. An action based on a belief sustained by confidence. Because God's wor word says something is so, you believe it to be true, and you act accordingly. That's faith. But you and I exercise faith all the time. I'm exercising it right now, being on this pulpit. Every one of you is exercising faith sitting on those chairs. If you didn't think those chairs would hold you up, you wouldn't take a chance to sit on them, right? If you thought they had a bad leg and you'd fall on your backside if you uh, put pressure on it, you wouldn't take the chance to do that. But you have confidence that it's going to hold up, hold you up and support your weight. That's why you go ahead and sit on it. If I didn't think the light switch would, would bring on the lights, I wouldn't waste my time turning it on and off. 
So you and I exercise faith all the time. We just don't think of it in those terms. But it's an action based on a belief sustained by confidence. Um, the, now, the, the cases that follow are examples of this. Uh, there in chapter 11, verse 4, we have the case of um, Abel. By faith, Abel offered unto God more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. I mentioned Jack Chick in our sermon time. Jack Chick, being dead, yet speaketh. A guy who had written over 200 books, each one of those tracts is a separate book in the Library of Congress. And uh, have those things translated in about 120 different languages, and well over a billion copies over the last 60 years, that made him the most prolific and the most widely circulated Christian author in church history. More people have read Jack Chick's comic tracts they never read anything written by Martin Luther, or read anything by the Catholic Church Fathers, or read anything by Joseph Smith or Mary Baker Eddy or the Seventh-day Adventist movement, or any of their works. More people have read Chick tracks, and nobody knows who Jack Chick was, is, or was. He kept a very, very low profile, let the tracks do the talking, let the tracks do the work for him as God would lead and direct. And, um, I was very privileged to know him and work for him when I did. And uh, the world lost a great man, a great soul winner. Who knows how many people have been saved and have come to Jesus Christ through the ministry of Jack Chick's tracks. People that Jack never met and they never met him. Every track is said to be a proven soul winner. And as people respond to the tracks and the, the message that's conveyed in them and how it's written, and the stories that are in them, and uh, they respond, they resonate with certain people. That particular story resonates with somebody. That's what I had a question about. I'm glad I found that track, and it answers some things for me. It told me how I can trust Jesus Christ uh, and depend on Him for my salvation. And so that's why you have a variety of tracks, because each one may influence somebody in a different way. But, um, and then verse 5, we read about Enoch. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. And jump down there, verse, well, of course, then verse 6 again. By faith, without faith it is impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 7, we have the case of Noah. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of, of righteousness, of the righteousness which is by faith. Then by verse 8, we have the case of Abraham. By faith Abraham, uh, when he was called to go into a place which God should, uh, after, excuse me, which he should after receive, for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. So he had the instruction of God to go a certain place, not knowing exactly where God was going to lead him. So he had a, he made an action based on a belief and sustained by confidence. That's a very simple definition of the ABC or the ABCs of faith. Now I'm going to come back to this same section and look at a few more elements next time, God willing. But I'm going to stop right there. I've given you plenty to think about. And uh, the book of Hebrews is very instructive. It's very important that we understand the differences uh, in salvation right now by grace through faith and salvation in the future when we're depending upon faith and works. There are a lot of things in the general epistles that are still a benefit and a blessing and an inspiration to us here in the church age, but literally and technically someone's going to be obliged to follow them to the letter to keep his salvation or to earn his salvation by grace, but by, by grace and works in the tribulation. I'm glad I don't live in that time. I'm not going to live in that time. You know what? I mentioned this recently. There are some 
Christians who say that the church is not going to be raptured, it's going to go through the tribulation until the glorious return of Jesus Christ. Well, if the, if the church has to endure the tribulation, then there is no tribulation. It's effectively still the church age, if the church is still here. But, so the church has to disappear in order for there to be a tribulation. Follow? Are you, gonna, are you trying to tell me that right now I'm saved by grace through faith and I'm sustained by the mercy and the grace and the love of Jesus Christ to keep me saved no matter what I do? But watch out, uh, in the near future there might come a day when my salvation is then in jeopardy if I don't maintain good works and help the Jew in his time of persecution, make sure I don't take the mark of the beast, and all those other things um, described for us in the Word of God. You're trying to tell me that I'm going to be living in two different uh, dispensations one where I'm saved for sure, and suddenly I won't be saved for sure. I, would, I reject that completely, and I think any real Bible believer would reject it completely. If the church is still here, uh, then, it's not, then there is no tribulation. It's effectively still the church age. 